Uh, hello everyone, welcome back to Britain's Hangout Hour episode 77. I am here today with another indie author, or wait, are, are you an indie author? I don't, don't want to get that wrong. I am, sir, yeah, I'm definitely an indie author. Okay, very good. I'm here with P.L. Stewart today, the um, the writer. How are you doing today? I'm awesome. Uh, how you doing? I'm, I'm, I don't think I've ever been, no, that's not true. I have been interviewed from someone from Oklahoma before. Oh, really? You're from, are you, you're in Oklahoma, right? I am in Oklahoma, yes. <laughs> yeah, home, home of my, yeah. home my favorite, my favorite fo football college team, the Oklahoma Sooners. So. <laughs> uh, wait, uh, wait, aren't you Canadian though? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, I remember my favorite American college team is the Oklahoma Sooners. Has been since I was seven or eight years old when I first watched football. And I turned on, I saw Billy Sims running, running, and I was I didn't really understand what football was. And I saw this this guy running and breaking tackles. I was like, oh, that's such a cool thing. And then that's, uh, yeah, since then I've loved football. And in terms of American college, Oklahoma's my favorite team. All right. That's, that's very cool. Yeah, my dad actually met um, Billy Sims. This was oh wow uh, long before I was born, of course. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> but he yeah. has a photo of it. He's very proud. Uh, he's, he's, oh, that's he's amazing. His whole life. Um, but, yeah, um, I'm glad I'm glad you were able to make it today because, um, you know, you've, you've become Thank pretty you. well-known in the, in the indie community as well as BookTube community. Yeah. Um, so if you'd like to like you know you know introduce yourself and like pitch your work or something, uh, feel free. Oh, thanks. I'm humble. I don't know how well known I am, but uh, yeah, I'm P.L. Stewart, and I am the author of the John Kingdom Saga. It's a planned seven book series, uh, four books out now. If you forgive the self promotion, the the, lot, the most recent one, book four, Lions Pride, came out this year in the spring. I essentially publish a book in the series every year. Again, a seven book series. I'm up to book four. I'm writing book five now. That'll be out in the spring of 2025. It's entitled A Pack of Wolves. So at this pace, I plan to publish the last book in the series in 2027. So um, it uh, follows a flawed uh, character, a bit of a messed up, messed up dude, um, but he is essentially the last leader of the survivors of what I, my version of Atlantis. Sure, most of you are familiar with the Lost Rome of Atlantis, not Fable by Plato. I know so yeah, that's is. yeah, that's that's the essence of that of the of the book in the series. Just quickly, and then in terms of book two, I mean, I, I'm a blogger. Book two, something that I've taken to a lot more recently. Um, I do have my own channel, The Dragon Saga 7847. I do interviews. I do um, book reviews, uh, things like that. Um, I have a special uh, interview feature called Six Elemental Interviews, where I, I talk to various authors and bloggers, et cetera. And the biggest part of my booktube life is actually shared. I am honored to be one of the co-hosts of Page Chewing with my phenomenal partner and co-host made between the pages. She has her own channel, check her out. She is wonderful. And that is, of course, under the Page Chewing umbrella uh, created by the wonderful Steve Talk Books, who has a great forum, pagechewing.com. So check that out. So yeah, I'm also a blogger for assistant editors for Before I Go Blog, uh, led by the wonderful Beth Tablet, shout out to Beth and our incredible Before We Go blog crew. So uh, I put written reviews there, and of course, I'm good so, reads. So. so you're a busy guy, it sounds like. Yeah, besides full time work, yeah, that <laughs> that's just, this is just all hobby stuff. But yeah, besides full time job, yeah, I'm, um, and family and all that, yeah, it's it's pretty busy, but rewarding. So. Oh, uh, but yeah, no, you. Uh, but you've also been on other shows. You've been on Tori's channel. Um, you've been on. Uh, you've been on Philip Chase's Dear Doctor Fantasy. Um, you were on Mike Molman's Bald and Balding. I actually had Mike Molman on uh, a little while ago. He's 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 a good he's a good dude. He's good people. Oh yeah, actually, all great people you mentioned. Yeah, all great people. Yeah, um, that you mentioned. Actually, yeah, I was about to say they're all good people because I actually know uh, most of them. I, I keep trying to get Tori on this show. It's just the stars aren't aligning and then she finally to be honest she probably just got tired of me asking her when she's gonna come on but um i'm like so well when you want to do it and she's all like i'm like bro i'm doing stuff okay we gotta maybe some other time i'm like okay 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 and i see her on like three other like streams i'm like come on but oh well but oh well. but i'm getting off topic yes you write you write fantasy though you've written um about atlantis which is interesting 
Yeah, I mean, it's uh, my version again. It's not exactly true to Plato's tale, and it's not. Um, it's not the. Uh, it's not. It's it's not reminiscent of anything you've seen on a lot of the uh, the popular like the Marvel stuff or the cartoon stuff where it's you know this it's all about uh, people uh, breathing underwater and and you know floating by ruins. Um, this is essentially, and I think it is somewhat true to Plato's tale. It's about a society that was at the pinnacle of the modern or the world that they they occupy. Um, not the modern world, but but a kind of a facsimile, um, an ancient world, ancient type world, and and they were uh, this monotheistic uh, in terms of religion and this this naval military superpower and. Um, at the height of their glory, um, no spoiler there, they, they they sink. And then this fellow Othran, who is the second prince of, of the realm, he's like the second line to the throne, and he, he manages to escape with some of the survivors and wants to establish, essentially rebuild at Atlantis, I call it Atlantic in my version, rebuild uh, Atlantis uh, on this new continent across the sea from where his uh, homeland was. And then he, um, <laughs> but he is uh, someone who um, fails to understand at first that the people in this new continent he's coming to, they, they certainly don't want um, someone like Othran, who is a colonizer, to uh, come and essentially take over their continent. They have different religions that he consider pagan. So definitely a clash of cultures and a fight for survival. And, you know, the question is how or to what degree can Othran reestablish himself and his people in this new homeland? Yeah, no, I, I, I hear you. I mean, I, I guess I guess a good question, and I don't know if you've been asked this a lot. Um, well, it, it won't be a, what inspired you. I'll, I'll, we'll get into that. But um, one thing I like to ask fantasy authors when I have them on this show, I, I like to ask them, uh, what draws you to the fantastic? I think for me, I've loved fantasy since I was very young. Um I read a lot of the classical stuff and because of school and later in life, as I went through university, I know, medieval literature and history, that was what I specialized in. And I, I've always had a fascination uh, for fantasy. I, you know, you, when you're younger, you read a lot of the, the typical stuff, the, the Chronicles of Narnia and, you know, the, the, the Lord of the Rings. And, you know, you, you graduate and I graduated to to more complex fantasy as I got older and then in school, you know, um, and again, reading a lot of, of more, what most people consider, consider more classical stuff, you know, the Iliad, the Odyssey, Paradise Lost, et cetera. And of course, you know, Lamort to Arthur and, and, and school. And then I got away from fantasy for a while. Uh, you're going to more uh, police procedural and thriller type stuff for what little bit of time I had reading when I was an adult. And, but I always wanted to write a fantasy book. I think what draws me to fantasy is the ability to um, lose yourself in alternate worlds. It's a bit of escapism, but also to be able to tell um, tales, especially when it comes to morality, et cetera, in this more removed setting from our, our world that I think makes it more palatable. So yeah, there, there's a lot of reasons to love fantasy. Love the world building, love the lore. You know, it creates a lot of excitement, especially if you have... Um, you know, the more military fight type fantasy with, with epic battle scenes and, you know, so yeah, lots of great elements to love in, in fantasy. You know, it's kind of funny you brought up like, um, crime procedurals. There's, uh, I don't know if you've read S.A. Cosby, but like, I've, I've looked at you before. I'm like, you kind of, kind of looks like S.A. Cosby a little bit, except you have, you have more gray in your beard than he does. <laughs> oh, you're, you're muted a little, you're, you're muted. I didn't hear what you said. Oh, sorry. Yeah, in my fifties, a lot of gray hair. So no, no, I haven't read S.A. Cosby. I've heard of, I've heard of S.A. Cosby, but I haven't, haven't, haven't read. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's. Uh, but yeah, the the police, police procedural thriller stuff is also great, and you know, I, a lot of it's more the escapism, the pure escapism, you know, type reading who done it. You know, it's pretty usually pretty standard formula, but fantasy can be, and not that they can be complex books, uh, but I find the fantasy to be. At least the stuff that I read, a lot of complex um, books, especially in terms of the themes. So that's what draws me in. Yeah, it's yeah, I, I, I agree. It's it's um, I, I really like fantasy because it's really the the literature of imagination, kind of like um, science fiction is. <laughs> I think it was Rod Serling who said um, science fiction is about what is uh, possible, and um, 
fantasy is about the impossible. I, I think someone else might have. No, I think uh, Ray Bradbury actually said that. I could be wrong. I don't know. It's been a while. <laughs> Two very famous you know, Rod Sterling. I loved to watch the Twilight Zone when I was younger. And uh, yeah, I read a bit of Bradbury back in the days. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Great stuff. <laughs> yeah, no, I, um, I, uh, I, uh, I actually started watching Twilight Zone in, in the eighth grade because one of my teachers was a big fan and he just kind of started playing it for us and I, you know, I was a weird kid, I freaking loved it. <laughs> All the other kids were like this is black and white, what is this? But, um... <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. It's, um... Yeah, it's a great show. I, I love it a lot. It's some of my favorite speculative fiction anyway. At least on the screen. There's, there's plenty of great, you know, books. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely yeah no and and i love watching films too sci-fi fantasy films are you know i mean some of my favorite films among them you know I, I i love i love peter jackson's version of lord of the rings it's probably one of my top 10 favorite well there's a bunch of movies it's three so but they're certainly in my top 10 probably all three of them uh in terms of you know movie watching and you know dune i haven't actually watched the second one yet first one but I hear the second one is absolutely incredible so um you know love historical fiction as well I've been recently been watching Shogun uh, I haven't read the the, the books but I uh, love yeah, that my series so. telling me to watch Shogun and I'm like I have a bunch of, oh. have a bunch of friends who are telling me to watch it I know so I, I just yeah, phenomenal to... yeah highly recommend it phenomenal I need, to, I need to get in on that Hulu action but um I've seen trailers it looks incredible so yeah, yeah, I'm looking fantastic. forward to seeing it when, whenever that'll be. Um, <laughs> you, you also had a. I also saw you were in a conversation about um, uh, religion and fantasy, which was interesting, because like I, I have a, I have a bit of a vested interest in religion. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was it was really fascinating. It was on, on Angela's uh, the Unicorn Reads uh, channel. She was the whole. She is amazing. And uh, I didn't really belong. There were some pretty big brains on that on that panel, including Angela herself. I believe she's a PhD, and so is Philip Chase. And uh, we had AP Canavan, I believe, who's also a PhD. And Laura. And she's a, a master's. In like there were some pretty some really smart people. Holly Tinsley, a good friend of mine, very intelligent uh, writer. She writes um, Grimdark Fantasy. Uh, we met in Ashen Shadow, The Vanguard Chronicle. She's best known for. So yeah, it was a fantastic discussion and. Um, Religion is something also that's always fascinated me, and I write. There's a lot. I write a lot about it in in my in my books. Um, specifically, themes of you know uh, what religion is, religious religion versus faith, um, what it means um, in terms of you know uh, the clashes of faith and religious persecution and all kinds of, of elements. So religion is very much uh, a topic that's uh, near and dear to my heart. I you know I consider myself more spiritual. And former religious, my mother, however, is, and a lot of members of my family are very formally religious. And you know, people who go to church wouldn't miss a Sunday church uh, service or anything. So, um, but yeah, I, I, I've always found the topic fascinating, and and I like writing about it. So, yeah, no, I, I just, I, I guess, I find it interesting because, um, like, why, why do people believe it? You know, like actually, it's funny. I um, I uh, I met some Mormons the other day. And we've become friendly, and I actually got a Book of Mormon over there. I I, need, I was going to crack it open at some point. I don't know when I'm going to do that, but we'll see. I don't think I'm going to be converted, but I'm quite fascinated in seeing what it's going to what it's going to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean religion, religion in general. I mean it, it's fascinating. I, I like to so much of what I ponder and I've pondered about over the the years of my life, and now being in very much middle age. Um, you know, just the, the difference between all the various religions and the difference between religion and faith. And when I say that, I, I, I classify religion as all the trappings, the hierarchy, the, you know, the, the, the clergy, et cetera, built up around a specific religion and then a sort of specific faith. And then the faith itself, obviously, is that, 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 that pure belief in a deity or deities or your non-faith, depending if you're, you're agnostic or atheist, et cetera, and and I and I really, um, yeah, that 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 relationship between you know that belief that's you know for me somewhat personal versus you know everything else in terms of you know okay well you have a lot of people um, essentially you know 
in charge, so to speak, of a faith, you know, which is the religion aspect. And I find all that really fascinating, the political aspect of religion, you know, the influence that religions have, you know, and again, you know, um, all of the, the different, um, you know, the, the demographics across religions and, um, you know, the, the, the individual denominations and, and even, you know, clashes within religions you know between denominations and yeah it's all very fascinating yeah no it's um i i actually read the way of edan earlier this year i'm, I'm actually hoping to complete the trilogy i'm i, I don't know when i'm gonna get to return of edan i i don't actually own it yet but um, when i when i do i'm gonna read it but i did read the way of edan i got it back there and it was very good and i actually had philip on my channel to talk about it so um, i had a great time doing that so yeah, it's it's interesting, and you know, there's a lot of, you know, I I feel that um, fantasy is is sort of modern mythology in a lot of ways, not not unlike superheroes, though it's 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 supposed to be more mythological because it's inspired by mythology, or at least some of it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and Philip, fantastic author, incredible person, just one of the kindest, warmest, most wonderful people you're going to meet. And one of the, the most brilliant and an intellectual, you know, professor, you know, medievalist, amazing booktuber, beloved booktuber, um, you know, and a fabulous author and, and his fantasy, his trilogy, it and trilogy is actually one of my favorite indie uh, fantasy trilogies, you know, ever so far. I mean, I, I, I haven't had the, the honor and pleasure of reading as many completed indie fantasy series as I would like. However, I'd have to oh, put just Philip... my toes in. I, I've been, I, you know, I've been, I, I mean, I, I've been kind of having some stuff going on, but I'm hoping to start the Legend of Blackjack soon. So, oh yeah, yeah, I got, I got that on my shelf too. I've been honored. I have a copy sent to so, me by. I got the it author from Amazon, and, and for some reason, some of the pages are kind of dog-eared. I don't know why. Oh, that's kind of. Oh, sorry, yeah. Okay, sorry, yeah, yeah. It's a little, it's yeah. a little annoying, but whatever. <laughs> I can, I can deal with it. Yeah, I have to get to that too. Like I said, it's on my shelf. I was honored to get a copy from the author. I have to, I have to get to that. But yeah, so many indie, so many books to read. Period. But yeah, so definitely. I'm kind of mad at myself after. I'm like, dang, I probably should have, because I, I, I know Andy, because I, I had a podcast with him, and we become friendly. I'm like, man, I probably should have just asked him for a copy. But I would have felt kind of weird doing that. So. Well, he's a great guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah but um, guy. you know, you, you wrote a f fantasy. Um, what? What made you want to write about Atlantis in particular? You know, because like, I, I you know I've noticed there's a lot of untapped um, potential in a lot of fantasy. Like you know, I've noticed recently that there's more like you know we're starting to see more diversity um, in the fantasy genre in terms of the mythologies that are being explored and the tones and um. Uh, what what drew you to uh, Atlantis in particular? Like, why why do you want to write about Atlantis? Well, it's one of my favorite tales. Um, since I was younger, I've been fascinated with the legend of Atlantis, and and I I also and I'm I'm a big lover of mythologies in general, including you know Greek mythology, Roman mythology. Um, you know, I and I and I definitely feel like it's one of those myths that you know it's 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 uh, timeless. There's so many people that are are invested and enthralled in this, and to think that right now there's people out there actually actively searching for Atlantis when most scholars would say that it never existed at all. However, there are scholars that believe that it must have existed. And just the, the 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 contrasting views, and and again, you know, there's there's people out there actively hunting. There's 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 millions of dollars being spent on trying to discover its location and. You know, there's there's uh, you know the the, the most popular um, theories uh, in terms of where it is, you know, versus you know the the other theories, and yeah, it's just it's just really phenomenal. It's been the subject of film, and you know, it's yeah, it's just the one of those film about it. There's or films, I think, that Disney made. Yeah, yeah, it's just an enduring myth. If it's a myth, and and it just uh, it seems to be something that has lasted down through the ages and still, um, you know, interests us and in some ways confounds us today in terms of if it existed and if it did where it is and people trying to find it and actually locate it. Again. So it's 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 just one of those things that I've always uh, really, really been drawn to. So, I mean, imagine, go, imagine finding um, uh, 
you know, imagine asking Plato about it, and he was just like, oh, it was, it was allegorical. I was like, yeah, oh, we just wasted all this time. <laughs> well, well, you know, even if it wasn't, again, an enduring, if it was, it was just, just make-believe and it was just allegorical, it, you know, I, I think it's still something that will continue to captivate generations to come. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm quite happy that I got the chance to write, you know, my version of the tale and, um, you know, hopefully people enjoy it. It's, it's certainly not going to it's not, it's not gonna be something that that's going to ever achieve the popularity of of Plato's version, the, the original version, but it's something that, you know, for me, it's a labor of love. And and I love being able to add those elements of the the actual story from Plato into my my books. So. so is this like a secondary world in your in your version, or is it a um is it our world just like is it more like you know Robert E. Howard, where it's like kind of our world, but it's kind of not? It's it's before like we kind of started, you know. Like, I, I, I'd say it's more it? more. I'd say it's more of a secondary world. Um, perhaps even when some might think that there's some elements of our world that, that maybe perhaps it's not quite a secondary world. I, I, I try to leave that somewhat ambiguous. Um, you know, there are definitely elements you're going to see that that mirror our world, but for the most part, it's completely you know fictionalized and you know the geography doesn't certainly map and it's you know so I I, I, I keep that part very very somewhat vague and ambiguous. However. You know, with the whole Atlantis reference, it definitely brings you into something that that seems to be linked in some way to our world, but but clearly set in a very ancient historical context. So, oh, okay. Well, you know, I'm just I, I was curious because you know I, I haven't I haven't seen a lot of fantasy novels about Atlantis, or well, they probably exist. I just haven't heard of them. Well, except for yours. I've heard of yours because I've, I've been on YouTube and people are like, oh my gosh. So, wait, are you on Spiffbo? Are you in the Spiffbo thing? Well, I was a judge for the last, um, the last, with Before Go blog, which is one of the blog sites that was judging uh, SPFO, Spiffbo, the self published fantasy blog. Off. I was a judge for the last few years. And uh, uh, so, yeah, that's been, that's been phenomenal. Um, you know, and there's so many great self-published fantasy books out there, and and the contest has just become this, this larger-than-life thing in the fantasy, in the indie fantasy uh, self-published fantasy community, and it's fantastic. It's great that Mark Lawrence, who's you know a, a pretty famous traditional published author, that he started this, and the the blog sites have done such a great job of you know reviewing uh, these amazing books and 300 books. I mean. They're they're all winners simply by by putting their names in. Of course, you know the picking to go forward in the in the different rounds from from uh, semifinals to finals to eventually winner is subjective. However, you know they're all they're fantastic books, and you'll definitely find some quality books in there. So yeah, it's it's great being involved with Spiffle. I, I won't be judging next year. I have a pretty busy schedule, but it's been an honor to be a judge, and and I've gotten to read uh, quite you know, quite a few amazing books specifically because of Spiffball, so. Well, I mean, I, I was just curious because I, I mean, I've, I've just started kind of rubbing shoulders with some of the Spiffball people. I talked to Clayton Snyder recently, um, who's a pretty cool guy. Um, yeah. And um, I have completely forgot that he helped write the third Beyond Redemption book, so that was kind of embarrassing. But aside from that, um, it was it was a good time. <laughs> Yeah, Clayton Clayton is a brilliant, brilliant author, phenomenal, phenomenal fellow. And actually, Taylor and I made between the pages. We just had um, eight of the ten finalists. We interviewed them in two different uh, segments on uh, page chewing. Um, so that was great to learn more about them and their works. And you know, the, that's for the finalists for this year. Um, that just passed. They just just passed. SBFPO nine. We're now on SBFPO X or SBFPO ten. So. Uh, so just to clarify, yeah, we, we you know, Taylor and I got to interview the finalists for SBF Online, and yeah, it was wonderful. It was awesome. Yeah, you know, I've I've thought about kind of, you know, talking to other Spiffbo people, but I just don't know how to get into contact with them yet. <laughs> Plus, my my channels, well, I have like three hundred. Let me let me look how many subs I got again. Three hundred thirty-four so far, so I'm I'm doing okay. Well, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. <laughs> certainly more than, certainly you know that's more than me. Um, you know, and and, and again, um, I think you're an Indian you know, author. You have like an advantage over me. What what is this? 
<laughs> well, you know, I mean, and all, yeah, congratulations to subs. I mean, for me, it subs isn't really the focus of monitor whoever well, follows no, me, but I mean, but, yeah. no, but uh, it's just kind of it's just kind of something I find funny. You know, I, I it's funny. I, I talked to Laura like before she started blowing up, and it's it's kind of funny now. You know, I just look back at my channel. I'm like, oh man, memories. <laughs> that's awesome but yeah in terms of the this fifth bowl finalist or any indie author you know i think we're all pretty accessible and a lot of it is simply reaching out through whatever means social media means typically like if you if you have a mutual follow on instagram or twitter or whatever site you're on and just giving them a shout and a lot of times you know they'll you know they're i mean everybody's busy but i think they're some of the most accessible and willing to you know engage and come on you know, yeah, they're podcasts. definitely more accessible than like trad authors. I would like to talk to. It's but that's on my like bucket list of, of people I want to talk to. <laughs> well, tr trad authors are, are depending on the author can also be really accessible, and it, it doesn't in regards to the profile. I mean, you've even heard people like Tad Williams, you know, who's you know to me one one of the more one of the most famous you know trad authors out there. Uh, I'm fortunate blessed to be friends with you know some of them. Jenny Wirtz, who's a a good friend of mine. She's she's iconic. She's you know I think one of the best um, fantasy authors of every generation. You know we've interviewed people like Evan Winter, Rage of Dragons. You know his first book was a top time top one hundred fantasy. Oh, you know I lots of Canadian. Uh, yeah, and you know lots of uh, we've we've interviewed tons of amazing uh, traditionally published and self published authors. So a lot of times it's simply just you know reaching out and seeing if they're. You can fit in the schedule, and and a lot of times, they, more often than not, you surprised they, they'll say yes. So yeah, no, it's I I did I don't know if, I don't know how much horror you read, but I uh, I did I did reach out to Laird Baron, and he did express interest in coming on my show. So yeah, I, I'm definitely hoping to get that together at some point. So that well, that's was, fantastic. That was kind that's of amazing luck right there. <laughs> I'm that's like, thank amazing. God, you know, I'm like I thank God every day that one but no it's it's fun talking to indie authors it's interesting seeing you know indie off indie thing blow up and people aren't just saying it's like pipe dreams anymore it's not just like vanity projects anymore like it's actually like people telling actual stories that you know people are like this is pretty good uh now again i'm only kind of dipping my toes into it at the moment because i if you can see back there i have a bunch of other books um, <laughs> it's probably blocked by my name there, but, um, I have a bunch of books that I need to read. So yeah, when I learned about indie, I'm like, Oh yay, more books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a whole, it, I mean, and we're just talking about one little part of the genre, science fiction and fantasy and even horror. I mean, you know, I have friends that write in the indie romance well, you and they are like, they sell thousands and thousands and thousands of books. They, they're pretty prolific. Most of write shorter books and they, they might publish 5, 10, 15, 20 books a year. But that whole genre is huge. You know, the thriller, mystery, police procedural. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the police procedural mystery indie side is, is immense. And they're also publishing many books a year, sometimes oh 10, 15 books. And, you know, I mean, a fantasy sci-fi where we tend to write these big chonkers, so it takes a bit longer. Um, you know, but but yeah, the the indie scene in general is That's just insane. It's it's massive, and and in and in science fiction, fantasy, in my little corner of 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 booktube in the indie community, I mean, yeah, people who are have written like you have some of the the um, you know the 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 OGs, you know, the the Clayton Snyder's and the 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 Michael R. Fletcher's and the Ben Galleys and the Dirk Ashton's that you know have been in indie for a while. They kind of were. Many of them were trailblazers, and you know, you see over the last ten years how the landscape has changed so much. And now you have indie authors like the Will Whites, who are New York Times bestsellers. You have, you know, authors like Ryan Cahill, who are you know selling you know, thousands of copies, and in a few years, thousands, thousands of copies, and are you know, it's it's just a whole different ballgame now. But it's great, it's exciting, and uh, you know, I think uh, people are realizing that indie fantasy is just as good as traditionally published fantasy and and that you know um they're they're the things are blurring and and lines are blurring and things are changing in the industry rapidly there's a lot of traditionally published authors who decide to publish a few series indie here and there and there, there's a lot of crossover and you know but the main thing is Smith bow you know yeah 
Yeah, books are books, and and you know it's how you consume your books and how they're published really doesn't matter as much as long as you like them and you're reading what you like and you can like both and there's nothing wrong with that. So I, you know, that does bring me to a, a topic, and I don't know if you've talked about this before or if you're like irritated with it or something. I don't know, but um, I, I, um, I, I, I've talked with a few people and I've heard a lot of people who you know are, you know like fine with indie but there's some you know I, I actually wrote a novel not too long ago i'm editing it right now um I, Congratu congratulations thank you um, awesome. i don't know what to do with it but i have a friend who or i have some friends who are like telling me not to do indie because i'm I, I mean again i'm not sure what i'm gonna do yet but no uh, I'm, I'm not even there yet so i guess i shouldn't be worried about it now but it's something that's been in the back of my mind um, no, I think that's a pretty really legit. And congratulations on the book. I, I wish you the best of success. I'm sure it's it's gonna be great. Can't wait to read in the future. And uh, but I think um to be honest with you, and I've written well, magazine well, I, I guess magazine the question articles I'm gonna ask because I'm kind of rambling here. Uh like do you think there's like a difference in quality between indie and and um traditional publishing? Because um I've heard a lot nope. of arguments about that and it's kind of it's kind of interested me. <laughs> No, I, I, and I honestly believe that it doesn't matter how you publish, to be honest, as long as you get published, if that's your goal. If you want to get your book out there and sell books one day and have other people read your work, I think the most important thing is that you publish, irrespective of how you publish. And I think, you know, one has to be um, realistic about your goals and figure out what your goals are, first of all. Um, how quickly do you want to be published? Um, you know, do you want the uh, creative freedom or is it more for, you, more for you to have uh, an agent that can help you with things like negotiating, um, you know, international language rights? Not that you can't do that as an indie author, but, you know, do you want the uh, the backing of a traditional publisher behind you? Or are you more concerned with uh, being able to essentially write what you want to write and and see those see those uh, royalties and have the, the ability to, you know, write as many books as you want a year? Or, or as few, um, do you not want to be bound contractually? Do you prefer to get an advance up front so that perhaps it will help you more write full time? Like, there's so many things that you have to consider, you know, which way you, you go publishing. But quality wise, I mean, you have to remember there's a lot of uh, independent authors out there who some of them, you know, not even not as much now as, sorry, not as much in the past, but as now, a lot of them have agents, they've queried, their books are um, very professionally edited exceptionally well edited, exceptionally clean. They have great covers. They have, you know, they have everything that you could want in a traditionally published book to the point where, um, you know, there's there's independent authors that certainly outsell, a, you know, quite a few traditionally published authors. Um, they're, there's, they're just different ways of publishing. Um, I think, again, the landscape is really changing. There are definitely advantages to traditional publishing and there's advantages to indie publishing. So I think it's a lot more about doing your homework and your research figuring out what the best venue for you to publish in based on your aspirations, your goals, et cetera, your tolerance level, your patience, um, you know, but, but I mean, it, I mean, for the most part on Amazon now, um, you can go where most people buy their books in the world. It's not in physical bookstores. I mean, I, I would challenge you in, in, you know, like with a lot of the, with, there's a lot of good books out there that um, if I pull them up beside each other, you wouldn't know, uh, unless you knew just because of, of common knowledge that this was traditionally published or this was indie published because the books, the, mm -hmm. the quality just as good. So, um, you know, but no, I, I think in terms of um, publishing, it's again, there's advantages, disadvantages, but the quality, no, I, I think that the main difference is that independent authors, for me, the main difference is that independent authors, for the most part, um, they have a certain latitude to write certain things that perhaps aren't seen as, as marketable in the uh, traditionally published world. There's a few more restrictions there. Um, in the traditionally published world, um, you get paid up front uh, for a certain amount of money to 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 get your books in the hands of a traditional publisher, and, and that's an advantage there. there. Like I said, there's advantages and disadvantages, but quality for me isn't an issue. I have stacks of books. Half my shelf is traditionally published, half my shelf is indie, and they're I enjoy them equally as much. So. Fair enough. I, I mean, I, I'm just curious because I've given it, a, I've given it some thought, and I, you know, I've thought about doing indie because I'm like, well, the book I wrote, I don't know if someone like um, Orbit would take it because one, it's not very long, 
And two, it doesn't have like those really like sexy, you know, Sanderson magic or anything like that. So, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Maybe it, it, like it's a, it's a very niche. Like, it's very uh, niche. <laughs> I don't, think, I don't, I don't think that. I mean, right now the trend is for in traditional publishers for books to be much shorter. As a matter of fact, um, some publishers are are actually insisting that, you know, in terms of new books coming in, that there is a certain length and in and around the hundred hundred thousand. K to 120,000 K word count in fantasy. That's that's the big trend. I mean, that's for new authors. That's not for Brandon Sanderson or or you know Guy Gabriel K or or you know or or, or Robin Hobb or someone like that. I'm talking about if you're coming in new. So that's like going back. And again, you know, um, it, it just depends. Like the main thing is finding an agent, and an agent is a great guide. A reputable agent is a great guide in helping you you know, uh, refine your work and getting in front of the right eyes that can potentially um, get your book a contract, get your book sold to a publisher. So I think, um, you know, you, that's a good place to start for advice. And if you're going indie, well, you know, there's tons of indie authors out there that would be more than happy to, you know, help help guide you through the indie world. The beauty thing with indie world is that, you know, we we very much share our knowledge. Well, you're more easily team, accessible, so. so that's nice, the, the indie authors anyway. Yeah, but I mean, if you, I mean, like I said, the main thing is, I think you have to decide what you want to do. How fast do you want to publish this book? You know, do you, are you willing to wait potentially a while to get it published through the querying and acquiring? And, and of course, there's other ways to submit to a publisher. There's direct ways. All every publisher typically has an open window where an agent in manuscripts can can be submitted. There's all kinds of ways, but generally speaking, you're you're going through the the nominal get an agent, get a book deal that can take a while. Um, but then again, you get the advantage of if you're if you do if you are successful, you get that upfront advance. And depending on what that is, mm -hmm. and you want you negotiate, that can certainly uh, help setting you up for writing for a while. And you don't have to worry about upfront costs the way we indies do. You don't have to pay out of pocket. You know, there's lots of edges. And there's and then you have the indie side where you know you have all the creative freedom. You design your covers. You the title, everything you want to do is exactly the way you want it, you know, and and it's all about your personal budget and or, you know, taste, right? Uh, you write what you want, uh, you know, you, you don't have to worry about certain things. But, yeah, there's, like I said, advantages and disadvantages to both, right? Oh, so. yeah, of course. I'm not, you know, I, I, I just, I there are some friends who are, plus I'm also, I'm, I'm 23, so I'm like, well, <laughs> I, I could, I, I could possibly... Yeah. But, like, I don't want to be one of those guys who wastes 20 years trying to get, like, a book published. Because, my God, I've, I've heard so many horror stories from authors I love when they were first trying to get published. And they got, like, rejected, like, a whop ridiculous amount of times. <laughs> like, and, like, I don't want to be that guy. You know, I'm like, I don't well, want well, I, I think that's something that, you know, I think you have to be prepared for it if you go the traditional road. It doesn't mean that it will happen, but you definitely have to be prepared for that. And no, you I mean, also, do... I, I, I understand that it might happen. I just don't kind of like i mean i don't want to you know i don't want to turn 40 i know i'm 23 but i don't want to turn 40 and think i've wasted a lot of my life <laughs> but but would it be a waste if if at 40 you get that book deal and it's it's and it, and it advances millions of dollars and you turn That's into the next point. That's a good the point. next george the next george r martin i don't think you'll i don't think it'd be considered a waste right so I, I like again i i think it's and it's and you're going to look at you look a lot a lot at life a lot differently like my youngest child is 20. You're going to look a lot a light life a lot differently, trust me, at 23 than when you're, say, 40 or 50 or 60. That's true. So, <laughs> I mean, so, you're, you're much older than me, so I'm, I'm sure you have a lot of perspective. I mean, so I, that, that does make me interested in asking, that, like, did you try to traditionally publish this? or Because like, I, I met some people who, like, like I met Mike Molman, and he's like, you know what, I was too old for this. I'm like, I'm too old for this shit. I didn't want to query it, so I'm gonna just publish it on. My own. So yeah, that that was, that was part of my was yeah that was part of my decision. You, or did you try to query it, or is it just kind of? No, nope, that was part of my my. I did my homework, I did my research, and I think that's the most important thing. And and I was publishing and be publishing in my fifties, and I, I looked at it, it was like I have a lot more life behind me than ahead. God willing, even if I live to be ninety, you know, I still have more life behind me than ahead. And and I I wasn't I didn't have a a, a tolerance factor for. Uh, querying, trying to acquire an agent, then have that agent acquire, try to sell the book, then wait. And if you get a book deal, then waiting for that publisher to publish that book. 
And that time frame can be compressed sometimes. You might get lucky and it, it takes three, four, five, six, seven years, and it could take 10 years, it could take 20 years. So there's no guarantees, and I wasn't I wasn't prepared to do that. So self-publishing was always the only option. But beyond that, I really enjoyed the thought of the creative freedom. I was fortunate enough to have my wife, who's got a marketing background, and she wants to partner in this entrepreneurial endeavor. And she so she handles a lot of the business side, and I get to write frees up to do more writing and other things. And you know, with that in mind, I figured, you know, um, I looked at the the compensation. You know, I looked at the costs. We looked at a lot and analyzed a lot of things, and we just decided that um, we made the decision that self-publishing was the best route. And I don't regret it. I've never looked back. I have many friends who traditionally published, and I'm happy for them, and they're doing awesome. I have some self-published published friends that don't sell a lot, but they're happy. And I have traditionally published friends that don't sell a lot, but they're happy. And uh, but I have others that sell a lot, and uh, on both sides, and and they're doing well too. And I think, you know. If if you're the reasons why you write are important, and everybody wants to sell a lot of books. I mean, I think you'd be hard pressed to find authors that don't want to sell their books. My my goal is I want people to read them. (laughs) If you read my book and enjoy it, like that's enough for me. (laughs) Like you know. Yeah, and 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 I mean, uh, typically, um, if you've done a good, a decent enough job in marketing irrespective of, and even if you're traditionally published, there is still a certain amount of marketing that's downloaded to you. It's not just your publisher anymore. Those times have, have changed. Um, and if you, you know, if, if the stars align, a lot of it, frankly, is luck. And if things line up, you'll get the audience. And of course, there's a lot of hard work to get the audience that that you can draw to your work. Um, yeah, you'll 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 sell books. But, but there's so much more that goes into it than that. There's luck, timing, you know, what the market trends are. There's so many things that go involved that are involved I mean, and going to uh, sell it. So it, it'll probably take a while if I did try to query it. Query it? I don't know how to pronounce it. I, I, I can't English very well today. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's that's the, one of the latest trends, but that doesn't mean that there aren't books other than romance being published in the, in the, in the fantasy genre. So, I mean, again, do your homework. Um, you know, you, you, uh, you're, again, you're young. So, you know, you, I mean, I didn't publish it until I was in my 50s. So, and I know about author other writers who have written very successfully and published into their 30s, 40s, 50s. So, so I mean, um, to keep it short, so you were in that kind of I'm I'm too old for this crap. Screw it. I'll just self pub it. So, is that it? There we go. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. Very very yeah. good. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> But um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm just kind of, I, you know, I, so that's why, uh, that's also why I uh, started my YouTube channel back up again. I was hoping maybe I'd get a fan base and they can kind of, you know, they could also read it. <laughs> smart, smart play. I mean, a YouTube channel is, is also, just I've, like. I've quite, I've kind of, I've fallen back in love with content creation again. So, you know, there we go. Okay, awesome. So it worked out. <laughs> awesome. Well, that's great. And and YouTube is is. I mean, it's a labor of love too, but yeah, it's a great way to, to get your, your face and your name out there and, you know, for people to know who you are. And eventually if you're writing a book, then you'll have more people attracted to that too. But yeah, no, I mean, going back to you though, you, you wrote The Drowned Kingdom. So, I mean, you have, uh, so you have four books out right now because I, I can see them back there on your shelf. Um, so you got four of them out right now. Um, I, I guess this is one you're, you're asked a lot, so I apologize. I'm trying not to break the wheel here. Uh, but, like, what, like, so what books are, you know, aside from the Atlantis legend, like, what books or, like, fantasy series or, well, I mean, anything you want to talk about, um, like, what made you want to write your series? Like, like what intrigued you to, to do it? Or what, what got you to, or like, what books informed it? Or I hope you get what I'm saying. <laughs> Oh yeah, absolutely. And I talked about some of those books that the, in the formative years that, but I mean, I, I got to give shout out to this one particular series that really, like when I got back into fantasy and I happened to go to my bookstore, my local chapters, Indigo in, in, in the in the Toronto area and see this book on the shelf. And it's funny, now I consider myself, you know, friends with the author. I, I know him. Um, you know, I picked up Miles slash Christian Cameron's Trader Sun Cycle. Um, the first book is The Red Knight. I I was just, I fell in love. I was like, this is the kind of fantasy series I want to write. Knowing that I had nowhere near the skill of, of an author like that. I mean, Miles Cameron is a famous, you know, he's a reenactor. He, 
he puts he up those writing historical writings. fiction that name sounds familiar he writes a lot of historical fiction he writes sci-fi he's just a brilliant prolific author and just a wonderful human being so smart oh yes i think uh, thomas from sff 180 talked about him that's probably where i know him from yeah if you check out writing fight on youtube he has these short videos with him uh you know basically showing you um techniques with all kinds of medieval uh, armament and weapons and um, again, he's a brilliant writer and um, he's a medieval, he's a reenactor. He travels all over the world reenacting famous battles, um, you know, and he's a, he's a, just a really smart, interesting fellow. Uh, had the privilege of, of interviewing him as well on page chewing. Um, and he's just a great guy, you know, went to his house and got to play with all the swords and stuff. And yeah, yeah, it's that must just, have been fun. <laughs> just, uh, just a great, a wonderful human being, a brilliant very highly intelligent and a great writer. So yeah, so his series, um, Trader Sun Cycle, uh, that it really inspired me to want to write a big, epic, chunky fantasy series, which, you know, which is what I am doing. So if I can if I can think of one series that got me going, that's it. But what sustains me as I continue my journey in reading fantasy, some of the 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 books and authors and series that really I, I, another friend of mine, Janie Wirtz, her Wars of Light and Shadow series, which I, is my favorite Senate fantasy series of all time, and I didn't even start reading that, uh, you know, until until about a year and a half ago. You know, I didn't and... read Jenny Words until I, uh, you know, until I actually got on on the BookTube platform. I guess she was just one of those like really underrated names I just never heard of because, like, I you know, I guess there's always that part of you that thinks that you've heard it all, but I guess not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, criminally underrated and, and one of the best writers of her she generation. She does a lot of in, things. Like, she can draw, she's an illustrator, she can write, she plays the bagpipes. Yeah, she's she's like, she's kind, yeah, she's like one of the, I, I call Miles Cameron the most interesting man in the world. Jenny's like the most interesting woman in the world. There's nothing they, you kind of, kind of joke, there's nothing they can't do or they haven't done. And Jenny's like that. She's a world class illustrator. Her her paintings and drawings have hung in, in famous art galleries. Her husband is a world class illustrator Don Matz like she's yeah she's absolutely brilliant um anyways uh yep yeah, her book Wars of Light and Shadow her series um is is now one of my current major influences you have writers such as you know uh, N.K. Jemison, Bernard Cornwell um you know I can name like some of the the big series I've read recently that are really inspired motive you know uh, R. Scott Backer um his Prince of Nothing uh series um Malazan by Steven Erickson um, you know, this film, of course, George R. R. Martin, A Song Lights and Fire is a major, that was major a, that was a as well. That was a formative series for me, <laughs> even though uh, yeah. I probably yeah, should not, finished, not have been but... reading it when I was like, oh, God, I was 13, 14 years old when I started. <laughs> <laughs> sure, it turned out okay, despite reading it at that age. So, uh, yeah, so there, there's so many fantasy series out there. You know that I, I and so many I want to read that I'm sure will continue to inspire I me. Mean, my TBR is huge, and I, you know, I I can't read as fast as I'd like to read. You know, busy life, and there's so many books, and um, I'm privileged to get a lot of arcs, a lot of advanced reading copies of books, and I, I try to prioritize those. And but there's some series I I haven't finished that I really want to delve back into that are, are inspiring too. But yeah, there's lots. There's so many fantasy series out there that I I absolutely love and that are motivating and say, you know, I would love to write something on this scale like this, right? And hopefully I, you know, I have 20, 30, 40 books in me, God willing, if I, I live long enough and I'm able to have my faculties to write. But uh, right now I'm hung, focusing on right, getting this seven book series done first. And, so you're not like Abercrombie, you can you, you can still read fantasy and not get all worked up about it? All right, very <laughs> No, no, no. I, I, I find reading as integral, like the Stephen King school of thought, like to be a better writer, you got to read a lot. That's how I feel and that's how I am and that's my mantra. So I read as voracious as I can. I, I can't read as much as I used to, um, especially with my writing. And, well, and, I'm, I'm sure you have, you, I mean, I, I remember hearing somewhere, you're also a grandfather, so I mean, I'm sure you have a lot of things you're doing. Yeah, and I'm not retired yet. I'm still working my regular full time job. I'm not retired, but yeah, I have grandkids. Wait, I have what do you kids do for your full time job? Wife. I'm in law enforcement. Oh, you're in law enforcement. So wait, are you like a cop? So you're like, well, I don't, I don't talk a lot about, about what I do. But oh. you know, apologies. I, I just, I just don't. It's kind of one of those things in my. Oh, you like to, Oh, you like to. Out of, res out of respect. Okay. Out of respect, but I hear, yeah, yeah. I hear you. So I, I, hear you. I, I am in law enforcement, and uh, 
you know, but once I'm retired, I'll be talking talking a lot about it, I'm sure. So, but oh, seven years to go till I retire. So fair enough, fair enough. All right, I won't I won't ask then. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, or at least on this platform anyway. Um, but, um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, it must be interesting, you know, you started writing and, um, you know, I, you must have had a lot of experience that informed you when you were writing, uh, your series. Like, the, like, did, did you have more perspective? Cause you start, well, I don't know when you started writing, but like when you started writing this series, like did you have a lot of perspective? Because um, I remember reading uh, "Knock 'Em Stiff" by Donald Ray Pollock, um, which um, I mean, he started writing when he was like fifty. So, and you can definitely, when you read that book, um, you can kind of sense that a lot of experience that he's gone through, kind of informing that. Did you ever have a similar experience like that when you were writing? I mean, even though it's a fantasy and it's meant to be kind of heightened and not entirely in our world oh yeah and while i while i'm not not giving a lot of details here about my job certainly my my experience in law enforcement for the last couple decades is definitely informed and definitely assisted with with my writing and a, a lot of my experiences in law enforcement have have helped shape the things i write about um and my life general life experience you know again as a 50 you know plus plus year old person well i mean and, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't asking like about because you know you said you didn't want to talk too much about it but oh yeah no no but uh, this is the general life in general yeah yeah but that's the big part of it i'm I'm, i know you're not asking details no i appreciate that but i'm telling you in general that you know the law enforcement stuff has definitely been a huge part you see a slice of life that you know um not everyone sees and uh you have uh experiences and interactions with people that sometimes you know something would say that the typical everyday person doesn't so that's certainly um, really helped help provide that life experience. And, uh, you know, when I talk about people like Christian Cameron, Jenny Words, these people who are so multi-talented to do all these things, they've also lived, a, you know, a fairly long life. And I think all those things add up to making your writing credible. Um, not that you can't write credibly, obviously, as a younger person and experience is all relative. There's people who are younger who have had vast life experience if, They've done all kinds of things. They've seen combat. They've gone to wars. And, you know what I mean? But it's just, you know, I think uh, when you reach a certain age, you, you typically tend to have, a, you know, a commensurate amount of experience. And I certainly think I'm very happy. Um, I, I mean, I wish I could have written younger for other reasons, but in some ways, I'm very happy to start writing and publishing in my 50s because I think um, it's 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 that you know someone I guess you could say gravitas to my writing that I probably wouldn't have had in my my 20s and 30s, even my 40s. So. Uh, it's a good thing. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, I, I remember when I was writing my novel, you know, because I, I try and... Well, one of the reasons I like fantasy so much is that it's not our world. It's just kind of, you can kind of do what you want. So I don't like to, because, like, I, I have to say my life so far. I mean, I've had some interesting experiences, but so far it's been kind of boring. <laughs> But I'm like, oh man, does that mean I'm like I'm hoping no one will notice that I I, ha I don't know I haven't lived very long. <laughs> but I'm like, well, well, there are authors who've who've done well when they were younger, so I, I guess I can make it. <laughs> oh, absolutely! Like writing is is a specialized skill, and it's not that because you have life experience that means you're going to be a great writer. Writing is, I honestly believe, it's it's a talent. But that said, even though it's a talent, it's something that you hone and you work on, you improve. It's just like I see back there, you got you got some drums back there. I'm sure you didn't start off, you know, being able to drum as well as you can now. And if you play well, other I mean, instruments or whatever bird, you do. But I can do it pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that, but that's that's learned, that takes practice and writing's the same, it's a skill. You hone and you get better and you get better with time and, and time usually means age and, you know, so yeah, but I mean, yeah, of course, you can be a fabulous writer at, at at whatever age, as long as you can put pen to paper and and you can get your thoughts across in a way that that people want to read. So you know, as I said, for me, uh, I feel that life experience, and I tend to read, I tend to read and love uh, works from people of all ages, obviously. But but I know that uh, some of the my favorite books have been written, especially in the sci-fi by 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 writers who have quite a bit of experience. So. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, it, it, again, there, there are writers like Michael Moorcock. He wrote Elric when he was in his 20s, and I, I like Elric a lot, so I'm not saying it. But, you know, it's, 
your the the brain is not always a rational thing, is what I've learned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And you're not going to be the same writer you are in your twenties when you're in your fifties, right? Oh, so, God, no, no. I I mentioned someone like Jenny Wirtz. I'm sure. Her... I'm, I'm like I said, I'll be like when I turn forty. If I look back and I read some of the stuff I wrote, I'll be like, my God, what was I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I look at something like Jenny and her Wars of Light and Shadow series, which she just is publishing the last book this year, the 11th book. She started that decades ago, right? So the whole thing is 50 years in the making. So I'm sure she's not the same writer when she wrote this first book as she is when she just published this last book. I don't know how so, you do that. Like, like, again, maybe it's just because I haven't been writing as long, but like, I don't know. I don't know how you do that, right? Like 11 books. Like, I'm reading, hold on. I'm reading Jonathan Strange, Mr. Norrell right now. This is a big ass book. I'm like, how do you how'd she write that much? I don't get that. And she's like, and I've asked some friends who are other also writers, and they're like, just do it a lot. It, it takes a lot of practice. I'm like, yeah, and and if you get if you, you can get your with simple answers in other ter- in other words. <laughs> well, if you feel you can get your point across in 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 short books, there's nothing wrong with that, and it's proven to be quite effective and sell well and makes a lot more money in terms of the margins. Um, but a lot of fancy authors, and not all, obviously. I'd say a lot in our. If you like the epic stuff, they're these big, chunky bad boys like like mine, right? And you know, but there's nothing wrong with with short. I've loved novellas. I've read some great novellas recently. It's a great shorter book. So it's all about what you want to write. Well, yeah. No, I mean, I don't. I don't. I mean, I definitely think I could write a. a I mean, I definitely could write a chunker in in my in my future but it would be very surprising to me i don't, I don't see myself doing it right now because <laughs> like you know when i when i started my novel it's not very long but i wanted to because i was trying very hard to to skirt the things that kind of bug me about fantasy a little bit kind of like i didn't want it to be too long i didn't want to like dump a bunch of stuff now again I, I, I do like my epic chunky fantasy that's i mean that's great but like you know sometimes it, I, I wanted to start with something relatively simple that people could get into, and then I'm like, then I'll dump more on you as, as he, as he, and I'm like, oh, so I've suckered you in? All right, now I'm going to dump more on you. So I guess it's like a bait and switch. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, and again, um, I feel that if you are a good writer, um, peep, and you can sustain that over how many books, regardless of the, the size of the book or the subject even people will continue to read it and someone will will like it and they'll want to keep reading you so um you know i i'm sure you'll be successful with that and th- there's no magic bullet obviously but you know the main thing is writing the book and getting it out there that's that's the main <laughs> step right yeah so. i know it's it, that's 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 the main thing it's just like we'll write the damn thing <laughs> And it's it's funny you mentioned Stephen King. You know, to be a better writer, be a better reader. I kind of I follow that because like I try to read as widely as possible because, you know, I think when you experience very diverse, I think it makes you a better writer overall. So I agree with Stephen King on that. Um, yeah, yeah, and look how prolific and famous and great a writer he is. And so, versatile yeah. too. <laughs> yes, yeah, an extremely versatile, and and his books that. Predominantly, he writes horror, but he certainly strays into the sci-fi and the, the the supernatural and the like, the fantasy and you know, and the 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 slice of life. He he's written, you know, a lot of books um, that are that, that cross genres, and some of his books is his books straddle genres in themselves. So um, yeah, it's yeah. So you know, if your if your goal is to be someone like that, write 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 read 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 read, read rinse and repeat. So. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I also just like versatility in general. So, I mean, I, you know, I don't want to, I mean, you know, I, I mean, if I definitely could write fantasy for the rest of my life, I'd probably be okay with that, but I'd probably get bored after a while. I mean, I don't know if you feel the same way. I don't know if there's other genres you would like to work in in the future, but that's just kind of how I am. I'm not really, you know, I mean, if people, you know, if people want to keep writing fantasy, I'm not going to stop them. I, I try not to tell people what to do. Really tell them. And I don't want to tell you what to do. You're, you're clearly much more successful than I am. <laughs> no, not at all. I, I haven't. You haven't published your book yet, so who knows what, what how successful you're going to be? So, but no, for me, I, I dig it. I publish late, and and I have a bunch of fantasy books I want to get out. So, 
God willing, if I live, if I'm lucky, I'll get them all out, you know, before into my 80s before I'm I'm ready to retire from writing. Period. So I will be writing exclusively fantasy only because, you know, I have all these fantasy books in my head that I I need to get out. Um, and I figure by the time I finish them all, I'll be I have a lot more gray than I have now, and I got a lot of gray, a lot of gray now. So, um, but that's all good. There's there's people writing in all kinds of genres and crushing genres, like I said. And, but yeah, I got I got I got some serious fantasy books to write. God willing. Are, next, but you know, like, are there other genres you would like to work in, or is fantasy like the like your home for you? Fantasy is my home. I might stray um, into potentially down the road. Who knows? I I don't want to say never say never. Maybe a bit of sci-fi, maybe a bit of horror, but. And even a bit of romance, um, that might be another job. But but yeah, I, I'm probably going to stick. What I'm probably going to do is is stick to fantasy. But you'll see elements of some of those sub genres a bit more in potentially some of my future work. So fair enough. I mean, I always like asking authors of particular genres if there's any other genres they would like to play in because you know I I I just find that interesting. I just want to hear their answers. <laughs> Like, if I ever had Joe Abercrombie on the show, I'd be like, would you ever write a noir novel or a crime novel? I think you would do very well at it. But, you know. Oh, yeah. And I, th I think really talented writers can write anything. I don't think I'm quite that talented, but I I, de I, mean, I definitely, like, I'm one of those people I, I you know, kind of write what you know. It's, it's I feel that's, that's at this age, at this stage of starting to write, I'm, you know. But now if I had started off in my 20s or 30s, oh, yeah, I'd probably... We definitely branched out into a lot more things, but but I'm starting a bit later. So, oh well, it's, it says. Uh, so I I mean um I, I guess we kind of already talked about this, but like um I mean, so what is I mean aside from being about Atlantis, like what is your book about? Like you know what what is the story or like not a synopsis because I, I do want to read it at some point, but um like what what's the pitch for it? Like is it um like characters and stuff <laughs> yeah it was definitely character driven it's mainly about the about the main character it's somewhat of a character study and and my character is a very very flawed and mostly would say unlikable protagonist and he is um someone who's very bigoted and he's racially tolerant and he's racist and he's homophobic he's got all kinds of issues right and mm -hmm. part of, a lot of that has to do with his upbringing it's privilege, you know, being at the pinnacle of what was thought to be the greatest society in the world. He's a colonialist, so he, he's got some some issues. But at the same time, he's very uh, chivalrous, and he's honorable, and he's brave, and he's um, you know got a moral compass, and you know he's complicated. And um, you know that complexity spills out into the pages of the book in terms of what happens is a direct result of of who and what he is, and. Uh, and his interactions with people who may or may not change to a certain degree how he thinks. You know, you have this person who is trying to uh, reestablish dominance of his society in a in a new world where people don't trust him because his people have this history of being being colonizers and betraying their allies and all the stuff to get you know that they're ruthless to get to the top. And you also have people don't trust him because they know that. The playbook as him as a as a colonialist is to uh, subjugate, wipe out other people's religions, and impose his own on top of theirs. So, um, you know, but but there's a lot more to the book than that. That's I think that's at the heart of the book. But but again, what happens as a result of all this is a lot of conflict, internal conflict with the character, a lot of external conflict between the characters, peoples, and other peoples, a lot of battles. Um, a lot of a lot of political dealing and dealing is established alliances, breaking them. You know mm. what the cost what the cost is to stay faithful to your your values and to your alliances and to your your feudal obligations and things like that. You know, there's a element of magic. You know, uh, certainly to what degree does magic play a role? Um, to what degree does religion play a role? And and how can religions coexist? And so there's a lot of themes in there, um, a lot of complex and convoluted themes in some ways. I, I think I try to put it, lay it out as simple as I can, but yeah, and again, a lot of conflicts, a lot of battles. Um, uh, uh, there's some romance, um, relationship stuff. Um, yeah, so it's it's and it's a it's a seven book series, so I take my time exploring a lot of the themes that I that I've talked about and exploring the character and you know his his the people who surround him and the other characters also 
um, lead interesting lives and how they interact and what their role is in relation to the main character is also a big part of the story. So yeah, that's um, that's the Drawn Kingdom saga. Well, I, I, I do see it has some some good reviews from um, we got John Morrow who really liked it. Um, Andrew Wizardly reads. I, I guess he didn't DNF it, so that's good. Um, Tori liked it. Um, Ed from from the Brothers Gwen liked it. So yeah, yeah, you got some. Sounds like a good book from all accounts. So it sounds like it's been getting a lot of love. I should say. Um, well, you never. You're always gonna have good reviews and bad reviews. You're gonna have every the the best friend in the world has one star reviews, as do I, and I have five stars and four stars and three stars, and you know, no book is for everybody, and a lot of it is that you know um you write for an audience and as many people there's some people who that is their type of book and some people saw that's okay and that's the beauty of having all these books and all these choices um you know i'm i write for an audience i i'm honored that people like my book i'm i'm i'm, I'm grateful when someone writes a review and i understand people don't like it and hate it and that's all fine it's it's and when you write yourself and when you're published, you realize that that is the, you know, that's how writing goes, right? Um, you know, it's not for everybody. And, and by the same time, you will find your audience and people who like it. And, and also, um, you know, you write because you want to get the story out there and you're not tone deaf to criticism of your work, especially if you write for eyes. But at the same time, you're going to write the book the way you want. You're going to take feedback from your beta readers and your editors, et cetera, et cetera. But, yeah, I'm privileged that I have what small audience I do have, and that they seem to like it. And you know, uh, I, I I'm honored, and I, I just want to continue. And and the main thing is getting the series done because there's a lot of people that won't even read um, uh, what you propose a seven book series until it's finished, right? I I have I have there's Hopefully people that don't have... get any like Martin shenanigans or or Lynch shenanigans where they like can't put it out for whatever reason. I don't know. Are we are we not yeah. gonna get any of that? Yeah, I mean, my plan is God willing, as long as life and strength allows, you'll get a book from me every spring. And I'm writing the fifth book now. It's on schedule to be published in the spring, A Pack of Wolves. And if everything goes according to plan, you'll get book six in the spring of 2026 and the final book in the spring of 2027. And that'll be the, and that'll be the series. And then I start writing the prequel trilogies. Oh, and, my God. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, yeah, which I have planned out. I have. So, yeah, I have a lot to write. I have a lot I have planned to write. So, um, you know, I can't afford, for me, I can't afford to waste time with my schedule. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I, I hear you. I, 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 see, I see the beard. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know what? Um, I think, um, you know, that also keeps me on track. And, I mean, I think for most writers, their goal is to have a body of work, right? When you look back on their life, okay, in my 80s, if God was willing, I lived to my 80s and 90s, and you look back, you have this body of work that, you know, people can read. Uh, for some people, writing one book is enough, and that's great. And if that's that's all you want to do, you publish one book, that's fantastic. But for me, I want to publish a lot of books. I started late. So can't afford to mess around. Yeah, no, I, I, I hear you. It's it's definitely a um, – it's definitely um, it's definitely interesting when you start writing when you're older, I, I imagine. Though, again, I'm, I'm only 23. So I don't really have a lot of perspective on that. You know, I was telling my dad last night we went to go see the new Planet of the Apes movie, and we were driving back home. I'm like, I don't feel 23, and he's like, What, what do you feel like? I'm like, Like 19. He's like, Oh, is it because like I baby your ass? And I'm like, I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> I just don't feel 23. <laughs> he's like, Oh, don't worry. When you're when you're 30, you'll start feeling it. <laughs> I'm like, You jerk. Well, it's funny, like, at every age, I think the main thing is, you know, you say, well, what does 23 feel like or what's it supposed to feel like, right? It all depends on your perception and your expectations. Like, what do you expect to feel like when you're this age? What do you expect to have accomplished? What do you expect to, you know, be doing, right? I think that has a lot, a lot to do with I mean, I don't know how old you are, but I don't know what, what that's going to feel like <laughs> when I get there. 55? Well, 55? I mean, you oh, know. Okay. Yeah, you're about yeah. my mom's age then. Yeah, so I mean, I guess, I guess as long as you know, I'm relatively healthy, I mean, I think I have most of my faculties still, you know, I'm writing. I, you know, I, I, I enjoy life. Uh, certainly, it's a different stage of life because you're not raising young kids now. Like you said, I have grandkids. 
um, you know, but 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 I like to think again with the life experience and things behind me, it's it's helped make me hopefully a bit wiser, a, a little bit <laughs> than I was. I mean, when you I look was... very good for fifty-five. I, I must say. Oh well, thank you, sir. I'm honored, but but you know, um, yeah, I, I I'm happy. I got a great wife. I got a great family, and I'm privileged to write these books and to have anybody that wants to read them. Uh, so that in itself is a victory, right? So. I mean, are, are there any books you're like reading right now that's like you really get you excited when you're writing your series? Oh yeah, I got I got tons of books. You know, I, I mentioned some of them already. You know, I mentioned Jenny Words. I mentioned uh, Miles Cameron. Right now, the the book I just picked it up. I picked it up a while ago, but I, I, Guy Gabriel Kay is 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 an author. I'm really starting to get into like he's a canadian author try him for so long it's ridiculous I just... just a phenomenal his prose i'm a prose sucker for great prose and his prose is just top shelf um i picked up the uh Fionarvar tapestry it's a trilogy um i got that i'm starting that tonight um you know his work really excites me i talked about r scott backer i i really want to get back to his book i read the first book the prince of nothing Stars Becomes Before. I just ordered on Amazon the, the next two. I really, really, really love his. I, I want to read more, so I had to go go get that stuff. I mean, indie authors, there's tons. You know, Ryan K. Really, I've heard that's a really bleak series, the the Baker, Bacher, well, however the hell you pronounce it. Uh, and I'm like, God, isn't he Canadian? I, like, I thought the Canadians were, like, really friendly and, like, nice. Like, oh, well, I guess you go I mean, to Canada. <laughs> well, that's, I think that's the reputation, but I mean, Steven Erickson, who wrote Malazan. You oh, know, yeah, that's right. He's, he's Canadian, like, too. I forgot. You know, that. so, so, I mean, there's lots of, I mean, I think, I think what happens with um, those who are not as familiar with, with Canada in terms of, of culturally and what we represent, there's a lot of great authors and great artists, period, uh, that have come from Canada. But in general, uh, no, I mean, you know, there's, there's, I, I mean, a lot of the authors I love are Canadian, a lot are American, British, but, Anyways, we're talking about series, so yeah, the the, the R. Scott Backer, that's a indie authors. I really, really uh, want to delve into a Ryan uh, Cahill series. I've only read one of his um, novellas. I read um, The Fall, but his Bound the Broken series. Right? So excited for. I mean, with Jenny Wirtz and her now I've finished the War and Lisa chat. I want to go back and read her backlist. I want to go back and read a lot of her books. Um, uh, indie authors, like I said, Ron Kale, uh, J.E. Hannaford is another auth indie author that I've been loving recently. Uh, want to read more Anna S Smith Spark, The Queen of Grimdark. She's awesome. Um, you know, her books. Um, uh, just so I mean, I could go, there's so many books that get yeah, me. I've, just I've wanted guys. to check her out. I just, I don't, I don't know where to start. It's like, that's always the like, it's always the snag with fantasy. You don't know where the hell to start with, you know. Well, it depends what, what, what you want to, like I say to people, like, if you're someone who you just want to dip your toes in, see if the author has a standalone and just read the standalone because you're only in for that one book. And if you don't like the writing and you don't think you'd like the rest, then you read the one and done, right? But if you, you if you're pretty confident you're in for the, for the, for, you know, in for penny, in for pound, then start with the first book in the series, right? Their main series or the one that's most popular and, you know, see how that works for you right so yeah, I'm more like a more like a trilogy standalone nut with the occasional longer series if it really like grabs like something like game of thrones or something yeah yeah so as to explore she's got a couple standalones you know so uh check those out and you know jane so where has standalone. Guy Gabriel cakes apparently most of what he does are standalones yeah, they're all related. He has some sets that are like, essentially, in terms of they're not series, but they're related in the same. They're in the same kind of universe, but and they there's there's characters that that transcend books, but it's not really a typical series. So that's good. The one I'm reading right now, uh, Fiona Ivor Tapestry, that's definitely a series, a three book series. But um, yeah, like you know, check get check out, especially with indies. You got the Rob Hayes of the world. They write tons of standalones. They're right, series two. Michael R. Fletcher, he's got great stuff, and I've only he's got series Redemption from him, which I I, I quite liked. Um, oh, I I, I, I love Beyond Redemption. I, I loved it. I shouldn't I have, it. but I really I, I really <laughs> liked it. <laughs> I'm like, wow, this is uh okay. <laughs> he's really going for it. Yeah, and those are this, those are the best kind of books where maybe you don't expect to like it, and you end up loving it, and don't, that's that's my favorite kind of book that just 
it, it it's expectations and what I think of it, my dumb expectations, and it just either exceeds it or it subverts it in a really interesting way that makes me love the book. I love when that happens. So I mean, I'm not even um, the biggest magic nut, but what really got me into that book is like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to try and be real simple here. Um, but like the idea that the crazier you are, you're more powerful magically. I, I thought that I'm like, oh man, you could do so much with that. <laughs> yeah, and he did it so well. And, yeah, and really good. And, it's really good. Like, I mean, a lot of the characters are like not nice people, but they're you know they're interesting enough. Where I'm like, okay, I'm in. Let's, let's yeah, see. despicable. And another series I have to finish, and I haven't finished that series, and I absolutely love the first book. And see, it's just a matter of time, right? Getting back to everything you want to read and. You know, but I have made an effort consciously to finish more series, more outstanding series that I, I haven't read. I've been focusing that a lot recently. Like I read book one and two and say it's a trilogy. It's like, why the heck haven't I read book three? So I've been trying to loop back and read, finish off those series, especially, right? Yeah, I started so. talking to Clayton Snyder, like I said the other day. <clears throat> and, um, or well, the other day as I record this, because it's probably going to go up and it's, it's going to take a bit to put this up. But, um, yeah, I talked to him. I'm like, "Oh yeah, you you wrote the you helped write the third one. How how'd that go?" He's like, "Yeah, that was that was something." So, <laughs> yeah, the, again, the, you know, the combination of, of of those two writers, like Michael Fresh and Clayton Snyder, to me, some of the top indie grimdark authors out there. Like, they're just amazing, amazing writers. And you know, I have so much to read from both of them. I've only read a couple books from each of them. So, and I, you know, again, I. There's so much I want to read. Dirk Ashton, I haven't read his series yet. I haven't read Paternus or any of those books yet. Like, I have tons of books I, I still want to get to. I, so. I, I know what you mean. It's, it's you know, Frank Zappa said it. Uh, so many books, so little time. Or maybe it was too many books, so little time. I don't remember. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's 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 definitely so. Yeah, but anyway, and, and plus, but I'm writing my own books and, and obviously all the other stuff I'm doing, so. You know, sometimes you have to draw a line in terms of the stuff you want to get done. Right. So, do you like have so. a so when you write when you do you have like a, a a time where you like place down and write because that that's what I do because I can't just go like oh I feel like it and then just start typing away. I have to like I have to be more structured about it. Now, well, that's good. How much that's I good. Write, that depends on what I'm feeling that day. You know, so I've learned that you know I've I've learned not to be so hard on myself because like. I'll start, like, maybe I'll write, like, a paragraph, and I'll be like, well, that sucks. I should have written more. But I'm like, well, you got it down, so that's a victory. I've, I've, I've tried being less hard on myself. But, like, do you have a similar, like, way do you do that, or do you just kind of? Yeah, I think, um, and, and good for you. Kudos to you for someone who's, who's more structured and disciplined. I am not. Um, it's so funny. I'm so structured and different than I feel with other aspects of my life and my writing, but not with when I write. I think a lot is because I spent now more on, on, a, on a regular schedule, but I spent so much of my time doing shift work. So, you know, your, your, your body's all over the map. You're, you're, you're sleeping during the day. You're, you're, you know, you're on afternoons, you're midnights, you're morning. You, you can't really get an established time. You raise the family, you know, sometimes you're just too exhausted. Even when you're on your days off, you're, you're recovering, say you just finished nights and you're recovering and you can't. So I just learned to write whenever the vibe and the mood hit me. And, um, you know, I'm a bit more like, I have this internal clock that says, you need to get this done by this time, this draft done this time. And I, I kind of set myself a loose goal and then I tend to meet it. And then, you know, but I know. Way, I, I have a hard, I'm always like, bro, you better do this. You might get ran over tomorrow. You know, <laughs> and I'm like, <sighs> dang it. But no, I, I, I've been taking a break recently because I was kind of like, you know, I'm like, you know, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but just, there's some days you're just not feeling it, and you're like, I need to oh, step yeah. back for a little absolutely. bit and kind of get your act together. <laughs> also, yeah, was, uh, there was a lot of stuff going on, so that helped. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And you know what? I don't push myself. when I. But to be honest with you, I do have those huge – what gets me to the finish line is that these huge creative spurts, I find. And I just write pretty well. I mean, as any time of the day I have, I'm writing, 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 writing. And then suddenly I find out, oh, there's a first draft. It's like, wow, okay. And for me, after I get my first draft done, that's pretty well, it's game on. Like, once I get my first draft done and I'm sending it to beaters or editors, et cetera, and then 
revising, revising, second draft, third draft, fourth draft, fifth draft, whatever. And you know that the book's getting like, but once it's done, like the actual, like, okay, say it's 40 chapters, you got 40 chapters done and it's in some kind of workout form, but it's, for me, it's a lot easier after that. Um, it's that point to get to that first draft that for me is always the, okay, well, you know, but I've made it so far on time every time. So, uh, just to keep going, I guess. I mean, in, uh, yeah, it's it's a good way to describe it. I mean, it's um also I like to when I'm when I'm I like listening to conversations, kind of like the one we're having now when I uh when I write. And I'm writing a western right now because I'm like because I'm like, you know what? My well, I wrote a fantasy. And I was kind of like, ah, oh, do I want to do the follow-up to that fantasy? I kind of do, but I kind of want to do this western thing. I'll do the western thing for a little while, see how it goes. Um let me tell you right now, it is really hard to find, like, conversate, like, you know, you can go on BookTube and look up just conversations, people talking about just aspects of fantasy or whatever, like, the religion conversation you were a part of, like, God, when was that? Wasn't that, like, a month ago now, or was it a few weeks yeah. ago? Yeah, yeah, but probably a month now, I think. Like, it's much easier to find, like, you know, fantasy and science fiction writers talking to each other rather than, like, you know, westerns. <laughs> Though, yeah, yeah. So you know, I, I I like I like listening to people talk about the process, I guess, or something like that. I don't know why, I just do. Like yeah, I well, love those like in converse. I don't know if you've ever watched any of those, but like it's when authors are in conversation with like oh they'll they'll be like sitting in a college or something. They'll be like talking to each other about their books. Um, I I I, I love those. I love listening to those. Um, I don't know why, I just do. Oh, it's, it's great. It works if it's inspiring, but but there's lots of other lecture type stuff. I don't know about because Western is certainly not my my area of expertise, my milieu. I've read them, but I can't tell you about from Western. Oklahoma, so it's kind of a... yeah. But but I mean, you should you should really check out. I mean, as you know, the brothers Gwynn, they love their westerns. Oh yeah, that's and really they true. they may lead you towards like there's always a booktuber out there that especially in the general booktube page which is used. That you can, you know, you you punch that in the search button, and you'll find something. Trust me, you'll find something. So you, you know, just keep keep diving in there, and you'll you'll find something. I'm sure that that tickles your fancy in terms of that kind of discussion. I mean, for me, when I want in depth analysis, for example, I typically turn to AP Canavan or Philip, right? Like or Philip Chase. Like they give me my my that intellectual highbrow stuff that is. Some it's over my head, but I still I still enjoy it. I like to be challenged. I like to learn. Yeah, AP, and then you know, AP that dude's a genius. Like I yeah, I he is. Say, like I actually I actually he, that's another one. I talked to him not too long ago, and um, my God, like he's one of those guys. Like I don't know if I'm, I'm sure maybe this has happened to you, but like you just you're just you just feel dwarfed when you talk to him. You're just like, oh my yeah. gosh, this guy knows so much more. Like he thinks of this, he thinks so differently than how he, he's considered things I never even thought about before. Well, again, his education, life experience, but as well, you know, too, and we had, it's funny, we, we dubbed it Big Brain Energy. Taylor and I had A.P. Philip, uh, Jenny Wirtz, and John Morrow, who is a uh, uh, very prominent reviewer at Grimdar Magazine. And, you know, Philip, A.P., and, and, and John are all PhDs and all, you know, have taught and you know they, they they're back and John's Jenny like, like I said yeah. Mar John Marl's like an engineer isn't he like yeah yeah and he's 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 there is you know he's department head at the university like like these brains are big you know so we just kind of you know you suck up you, you learn and it's beautiful to learn and just sometimes just listen to it back and go wow and just be amazed and dazzled by by the knowledge that that they're putting out and just you just if you can just suck a little iota of it in, you yeah. feel like you've gotten smarter, right? So you know that was one of my favorite conversations this year, talking with, and it was Taylor, myself, and 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 those those four. It was just, I mean, it was just incredible, right? Yeah. We're gonna have a part two for sure because we didn't cover half the stuff we wanted to. I so. mean, I'm I, I'm I'm the same way. I'm very attracted wow. to to people who. Well, you know, not like you know, romantically attracted, but like you know, I'm like attracted to. I'm I'm I always like talking to people who are smarter than me because you learn a lot more, or at least that's how I view it. I'm the same way. Uh, that's I think I think that's why I interview. I think that's why I love interviewing because ninety nine point nine nine nine, more like a hundred and fifty percent of the people I interview 
um, have some knowledge that I don't possess and have their dynamic and they, they have, I learned so much from them and I think it just makes you a better person. And I think that's one of the reasons why I love interviewing, um, you know, because, because they get to interact with people that, that I, I'm, I'm siphoning knowledge off of, frankly, <laughs> like a knowledge vampire. You just, you yeah, know, no. so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it, that's kind of similarly why I do this show is because I, I like, well, it's also because I'm studying journalism at my at my college, yeah. so I'm I want to put those skills into good use. <laughs> oh, fantastic! But I, but That's I also, a great idea. But I also I also like talking to people and hearing their perspective, and it's always interesting doing that, even if um you know even if the conversations are not always um, are certainly the ones where. I'm like, oh boy, what are we going to talk about now? But, you know, uh, it's usually interesting. I, I like, I just like talking to other people and, and hearing what they got to say. That's why, that's why I do this anyway. Well, journalism is a great field. I almost went there. I actually, the co-op in high school journalism, I wrote for a lo local newspaper and it was, um, it was really interesting. And I thought, I actually didn't go there because I found out, and I'm not saying it doesn't, depending on what kind of journalism, and it depends on what kind of journalism you go into, right? But the, the initial stuff was, there wasn't a lot of money in it, right? So that kind of deterred me a bit. But I mean, and that's only, again, I'm not talking about if you're a foreign correspondent or, you know, I'm talking about, you know, initially if you're writing for a smaller paper. And of course, the, the, the industry is very much changing, right? It's all going digital. But um, yeah, like, but journalism was something I really wanted to pursue at one point. And, uh, you know, so kudos to you. I hope, hope that works out well for you because, you know, it is a fascinating. I mean, I, I like career. it, but like, you know, I remember I, I talked to a journalist um, who I, I, I really grew to respect. And he's like, you know, the best journalism, best journalism is really pissed off. And I and I, I thought about that. I'm like, I don't know if I'm like, I, I can be pretty angry. I don't know if I'm angry enough to be a journalist. <laughs> yeah. So, I don't know. I don't know about that. So maybe. Well, I don't know. I, I see, like, I, I really see like the process. Like, I work in my college's newspaper right now, and it, it, it's a oh, fantastic. Like, I like working with the people, and I like, you know, I like getting everything together. So that's always a nice thing. I think journalism is a lot of is about courage. I think that journalists are some of the most courageous people, just by nature of what they have to do and what they have to deal with. And I think, you know, when I'm not talking about, you know, someone who's standing there in the middle of a hurricane. Uh, blowing around you where you get killed necessarily or or or, or a cyclone or a tornado uh, that takes a different kind of courage and but I'm also talking about um, obviously integrity to deal with certain subjects and report on them accurately and truthfully and and expose certain things that are going on in the world so journalism takes a lot of courage so kudos to you man and that's what we want to do I think it's a very courageous you know field it takes a lot of integrity and courage to be a journalist yeah it's it's pretty tough because like you said it it is changing and uh, I, and a lot of my instructors are old school journalists who are like kind of angsty about the modern age. <laughs> so that that's fun. Yeah, well I mean I mean I think journalism is also one of those those careers now, where I'm not one of those, you know, who thinks it's going to go and I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. I just think it's changing cuz you know, we have the internet now. Well, absolutely, but every career every, every career thing it is. <laughs> Every career is changing. Every job is changing. Writing is changing immensely. We talked about publishing. Publishing is changing immensely. Everything is changing, right? That's that's those are what we consider advancements and and changes that are you know driven by our human need to to keep evolving and and you know not staying static, right? So yeah, no, it's yeah, it's uh, I mean I mean we got or well, we, I, I AI I use that term loosely because it's not sentient so it's not AI it's not technically intelligence but um, you know I mean we're seeing writing change like you said I mean AI is becoming a thing now or well again AI um, and um, I, it's kind of funny I, I've talked to you know there's a friend of mine his name's Jordan he's a horror writer and he's been doing these interviews with other horror writers. And, like, it's kind of funny because, like, he keeps asking them, like, what do you think about AI and writing? And almost all of them are like, this is terrible. This is going to suck. And I just, I'm just, I, I texted him, like, I sometimes feel like I'm the only one who's actually fascinated on what that'll bring. Because I, I don't know what you feel like. I mean, you, you've actually, I mean, now I don't think you should write using AI. I think that's kind of lazy and kind of betrays a lack of integrity there. But, I do think it's. I'm kind of. I'm fascinated by what you know AI is gonna do. 
I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm probably not alone there, but I feel alone sometimes because <laughs> there's people. It was like most of the people are like, oh no, AI. They're like, oh Skynet, you know, <laughs> something like that. What, what do you think about that? I'm, I'm, I'm curious. You know, you're, you're a writer, and I mean, you're an indie writer. Um, well, I mean, I don't. First of all, you know, I don't believe that I will ever. I don't want to say never, say never, but I don't believe I'll, I'll ever want to read a book written by essentially uh, a computer well, programmer I mean, algorithm. No, right? I'm kind of, but aren't you like curious a little bit? Well, I think what I'm curious about is is in general. When I say curious, part of it is curious, and part of it's maybe trepidatious or worried, and part of it is fascinated with. You know, I mean, let's face it. Like right now, there's a lot of traditional publishers that they're using AI for their. They're going. They're they're using AI for covers. Right, they're doing it. They said they're going to do it, and that's what's, you know, it's, whether it's cost saving, etc. They're, they're they've chosen to do that, and that's a that's a business decision, a pragmatic big business decision, right? Mm -hmm. um, for and for whatever reasons, and there are, you know, AI is something that's when and again, you know, like I agree with you that it's not necessarily, um, you know, full intelligence. It, it's pervasive in in our in our world. It's doing all kinds of things already, and especially if you're of a certain um, mindset or generation it is part of your life uh, for sure it's ubiquitous and i don't think it's it's avoidable but for me as an someone who considers himself an artist and for my for I my fellow careful with it for sure but um, sorry i don't mean to interrupt you no not at all and and again you know i think i think like anything else in life it will have its place it already does um all i can say is that you know i i want to read books written by by real people and I prefer my art to come from real people as well. I, and I understand that even something that's, you know, you're taking stock images from a computer as an artist, if you're doing that, it's 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 not the same kind of art. Probably with someone like Jenny Wirtz who who designs all her own covers and and paints them and then you transpose them onto a, a cover, right? But but I prefer that. And um And that's you know, I'm, not, I'm not saying like, you know, I'm not like, you know, I, it's weird. Like it's not I'm not like I'm not in the sort of, oh, yeah, AI, great. You know, I'm not in that field, but I'm like, aren't you at least a little interested? Like, instead of, like, just, like, the knee-jerk kind of... It's like we're in a sci-fi movie now. Everyone's doing the same... Making the same mistakes they keep making in all the AI sci-fi movies. Where they're, like, afraid of it, and then they blow themselves up. I'm, I'm hoping we don't blow ourselves up. <laughs> well, so, I hope so, too. Inter like I said, interest, as I prefaced it, you know, there, there's a level of interest in terms of, you know, the fascination with, hey, what's it going to do? And like I said, part of that, honestly, if I'm not, is trepidation and worry. But the other part is, yeah, I'm very interested to see what, what it's going to do and where it's all going to go. Gold. But um, I know, for example, I'm a person that, you know, is is notoriously, um, notoriously uh, horrible in terms of, of, of using technology. Um, you know, it's not that I'm, to I'm completely incapable, but... You know, like for example, I I always prefer to read physical books. I I read. Yeah, I'm the same I way. I, I've Andrew Meredith, God bless that man, but he gave me his book thrice as an ebook, and I read it on my phone. Let me tell you, that was a very discombobulating experience. <laughs> like, I, yeah. I like my physical books. Yeah, I'm not against having a Kindle. I've thought about getting a Kindle because I've heard. Yeah, it's I'm not against. Getting, I like I've heard it's cheaper getting Kindle. I just I don't know. I just like the sensation of re actually holding the book and reading it. Yeah, so do I, and I always will, and it's certainly not going to change as they get older, and I, I do have to read physical books, especially uh, advanced reader copies and things like that as a reviewer, but but I definitely always prefer physical books, like you can see from my, you know, just on my bookshelf. Um, I, um, I, I, you know, there's certain things about about AI that I'm sure will continue to be useful and, and, and wonderful and open up all kinds of new doors, but in terms of the dicey, and what now is the dicey involvement of AI in in, um, in writing and publishing and, and all things such as that? Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I just, curiosity is one thing, but I'm quite, whether that makes me Neanderthal, I'm quite comfortable with, um, with, with, re, with seeing cover artists design and draw these brilliant images that are, that are just from a human hand. I'm very comfortable with reading um, books that are, come directly from a human mind straight onto the pages. Well, yeah, so and you know, I mean, I'm definitely like I'm, I'm definitely like a fan of, you know, Richard Anderson who does um I think he actually did the first I think he actually did Beyond Redemption's cover as well. 
He made it look like a Western, though. <laughs> but I digress. Um, great cover artist. I, I mean, I agree with you there. I'm just, you know. Yeah, the, the curiosity. I mean, and, and, and again, you know, I, let's face it. Um, there's no stopping things like AI in, in, in where they're going to advance into mediums like art. There's no, like, the, the, you know, I fear is, 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 is typically bred from, I think, ignorance. And a lot of it stems, I think, from my own ignorance regarding, um, you know, all things technological. But, you know, that said, you know, I think um, as artists, um, we have to be prepared and flexible enough to go with uh, changes and, and embrace. I mean, change is something that I think is important to embrace in, in when it's positive, when it's when it's positive change, sometimes you can't always see the positivity in some changes and we human beings, in some ways we are so much embrace change in some way we so fight change, um, you know, but, but, but we'll see, we'll see where AI takes us and, you know, but like I said, I, I do have my concerns, but that doesn't mean I'm a writer or that they're particularly, uh, you well, know, relevant, but. I mean, I also understand, you know, I, I you know, we're, we are, we are different ages. So, I mean, you know, you're, you know, you, you, I mean, you grew up before the internet was a thing. I grew up just as it was starting to blow up, you know, cause I still remember, you know, the, um, not landlines that we were, but like the, like really old, like cell phones. Like I remember that I am, I am, I am old enough. I remember that it, just as, you know, before iPhones became a thing, I like that was right as I was growing up. Yeah, and of course, I grew up in a, in, a, in a time where there were no cell phones and, and, and there were no, I mean, computers were only starting to become prevalent. Um, you know, I started when I first started university, I was still using a typewriter, right, to type out papers. And, you know, like it's, 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 a, it's a very different, um, you know, it's a very different time, right? Um, but technology advances really fast, like very, very fast. And, um, you know, I I feel like, um, you know, again, there's no stopping uh, to what degree things like artificial intelligence, uh, you know, penetrate the art of writing and publishing. Um, but I think that, you know, the one thing about being an indie author is I feel that, yeah, there is a, a bit more control in terms of uh, how quickly uh, that advances into, you know, how you how you create your, your work and, and what you do with, you know, but... Um, I mean, hey, you know, you can, you can, uh, there will be a time, I'm sure, where a lot of even fiction novels, especially fiction is, could be put, composed by, by AI. And, and yeah, that's you know, what I'm, I'm worried about. I don't know if that's, I'm kind of like, on the one hand, like, I'm kind of fascinated by it, but at the same time, I'm like, I don't know, like, I, I have to agree with Simon Pegg, you know, it, it's still a computer at the end of the day. It doesn't under, like, it doesn't quite understand, you know. The same emotions that say human beings do. Yeah, and you know, I, I guess, like I said, we'll see. But right now, I'm very content to read books written by authentically human people and and enjoy covers, you know, composed by authentically human people. And you know, like I said, we'll see how the rest goes. But you know, I'm quite happy if 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 you know uh, if that stuff happens 50, 60 years ago, where we're at, maybe that's. That's changed to the degree that, you know, when, when I'm long gone, you know what I mean? Well, and, I, I mean, and, I, I guess I, I suppose it's a bit ironic. I, I mentioned I, I, I've al I always wanted to get a typewriter because, like, as much as I'm interested in what the future holds, um, I'm quite fascinated by the past as well, which I guess is another reason why I like fantasy because, like, or historical fiction as well because um, for a similar reason, you're looking at a different world, kind of going back to the fantasy conversation. Which is another reason why I like fantasy. I don't know if you. I mean, I hope you feel the same way. You you write fantasy. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, I love historical fiction, and some people consider my, some people consider my books somewhat historical fantasy, and you know, it's not it's not about classifying it per se, but but I can see why, and I love love historical fiction, and I love historical fantasy, so. Um, you know, and, and the past does fascinate me, and and you know, history fascinates yeah, it's like me. A, it's and... like a different world, you know. Even though it's our yeah. world, <laughs> it, it's yeah, hard it, to think like, wow, that was us like four hundred years ago. Like we were, you know, we were in like wood houses, you know, shooting bunnies or not bunnies, but you know, shooting things with like little ball bullets, you know. 
Yeah, yeah, times have changed. And, and I think um, there's a lot to be learned from history. And that's one of the reasons why I love it so much. And there's a lot to be learned from, uh, you know, the past and, and things that we've done well and things that we haven't done well. And that's one of the reasons why I write. So, Or, you know, even further than that, like we were throwing spears at animals like years ago. And, you know... I mean, whatever you believe about evolution, yeah, <laughs> we've we've grown a lot since then. Yeah, we have, and we'll continue to evolve. And some ways we'll continue to evolve very quickly, and some ways we'll be we'll almost seem like we're regressing. So, um, you know, I I I still, I guess, I'm still overall an optimist, and I still have a lot of hope for humanity and where we're going. Um, you know, that said, there are concerns still. Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, I'm, I, I like to call myself a beleaguered optimist because, <laughs> like, I still believe that we can do great things. There's just a bunch of idiots running around. <laughs> that makes it really hard. To... Well, well, I can I can say this, that, you know, um, you know, at every juncture in human history, I honestly believe that, that there's a lot of people in, in humankind that have felt optimistic about the future. And as many have also believed that this is the end, like we're about to destroy ourselves and wipe ourselves off the face of, of the planet. And, you know, um, I still think that still exists today. And I, and I, you know, I don't know, but it may exist for the next few millennium until either it actually happens or, you know, so, I mean, I, I again, I, I have hope for the future. I have hope for my my kids and my grandkids and you know the world that i still continue to occupy this is where my optimism comes in i'm like at least we've had the sense not to blow ourselves up like because everyone was scared about that in the 60s to like the 80s or well actually maybe even further than that it started in like the late 40s and then it went to like the 80s and i mean that's still like you know something people worry about but you know I'm, it makes me glad we haven't blown ourselves up yet yeah. Well, let's let's keep that that train going. <laughs> Hopefully, let's keep that train going. Oh. Let's keep that. Train. Yeah, I, I always see on Twitter. Like, uh, I mean, I don't know how or X. I I still call it Twitter. It's Twitter, as far as I'm concerned. But like, you know, everyone's like, "Oh, World War Three." I'm like, "Ah, well, let's hope we don't get into that." <laughs> yeah. Like I said, I think I think it's a lot a lot. For me, it's a lot easier to think positive and optimistic. I find that much easier and and much easier mental health wise and and everything else to you know um, to do that. So I choose to do that and think that hopefully we will never blow ourselves up. So I'm I'm really hoping we don't. <laughs> I'm, I uh, but you know it's I guess that's more science fiction's concern rather than fantasy. I'm, I'm sure in, in in your book you, you don't have like magical nukes running around. Unless you do, then in that case, uh, I'll have to read it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, 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 I won't confirm or deny what, what happens, but uh, let's put it this way. I mean, um, fantasy to very much, um, if you think about it, there's a lot of world-ending scenarios in fantasy, right? Dark, you know, the tropes, Dark Lord destroying the world or Dark dark Lady oh, or Dark you know, Person destroying the world. The ring. So we can confirm. Yeah, there's, there's there's all kinds of there's all kinds of fantasy books with doomsday uh, type um, you know scenarios that are worked into them. So um, you know, <laughs> you know, I, I you know I'm looking at your you know, Goodreads account. I also see you have um you've you've read some poetry on there, and that kind of interests me because you know I've noticed that there are some certain forgotten elements of the fantasy genre, or maybe. I don't know if it's forgotten or if it's just that um, um, it's just kind of, you know, gone off. But, you know, poetry and fantasy, um, I, I think, are often um, uh, mixed together. I mean, a lot of our mythology comes from poetry. And I've noticed, I don't know, I mean, because, like, I, I somewhat consider, I mean, if I weren't writing, I would probably either be a detective or I would be a scholar. Which I guess is a similar thing, because scholar is kind of like a detective, except for literature, or science, or whatever field you want to choose. But I, you know, I in my research in the fantasy genre, because I believe if you're going to write in the genre, you have to understand it. Um, there's the, like you know, there's a lot of styles and and um, tones that have sort of been lost over time, uh, which kind of makes me sad. I don't mean I don't know if you've um, 
I mean, I don't know what you think about poetry, but um, I, I think poetry and fantasy have a very intimate connection that um, people have forgotten about. And I think I actually want to do a conversation about this at some point. I don't know when I'm going to do that, but um, yeah, I mean, I, that was one of the things I was glad about when I read The Way of Dan is because, you know, Philip uh, really leans into that because, you know, and that makes sense. He's he's a student of that stuff, so you know he know he knows where it comes from. I mean, what what, what do you think? Like you, th- yeah, I totally concur. And and I, I I mentioned about how I feel about prose and especially prose and fantasy. And I I love I love poetic lyrical prose, specifically in fantasy. I think it transports me into that world in a way that um, prose that's more modern doesn't. And I mean, Philip's work, as much as it's accessible. He has all these elements such as poetry and song and tales that gives it that more archaic, you know, ancient feel that really draws me into a fantasy setting. You talk about fantasy feeling like the past. And I think poetry is one of those elements that can really help lend itself to to creating that atmosphere. And Philip does it so well. And um, so, yeah, I I love poetry. And and, and I, I think that poetry, my love of poetry, although I don't read nearly as much as I want to where I should, I read it very infrequently. Um, you know, that, that... I, I like listening to it more than like actually reading it. Cause I find when you perform poetry, it really feels like it really makes it come to life. Or at least I think so. I mean, there might be some people who, I mean, I know there are people who like reading it and like, Hey, that's great. But I, I, I like when it's read out loud because I think it's really, yeah, yeah. So dub poetry. So, so you know, I mean, I, I, I do agree with you there. But I also know that, for example, if if and we talked about prose, if the prose is is lyrical and poetic, I'll also find myself reading a lot of patches from book. We talked about Jenny Words. Her prose is is extremely uh, lyrical, poetic, and I find myself reading a lot of passages because it's so beautiful and reflecting on the passages. And you know, so. Um, I think poetry is definitely a gateway for me if someone writes in a poetic fashion. um, Yeah, it's it's funny you say that um, because, like, I used to say I'm not much. I I used to think I wasn't as much of a prose guy, but then I, but then you know, you start writing, so you kind of have to pay attention to it. And I'm like, you know what? Maybe I like prose more than I thought I did. So I I, I do like prose a lot. You know, especially I, I like evocative prose, and you know. Well, yeah, and and that's what I crave. That is my act. That's my entry point to any book. If a book has evocative prose, um, I, I may even tend to overlook a lot of other aspects of the book. The book that perhaps aren't 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 as enjoyable. But I that you got me. If you read evocative prose, the Jenny Wirtz, the Anna Smith Sparks I talked about, the guy Gabriel Kays, you know, the, the when you have writers like that that can write such the, the, their prose just dazzles you in and of itself i you got me hooked man so that's what i what i love to read so yeah i mean i i guess what i'm i'm curious to ask you is like do you think there are some things that you like in fantasy that that have sort of become forgotten over time that you hope would like to that you would like to see make a comeback because you know i've read something like beyond redemption and i remember it reminded me a lot of like elric and well, not really. There's not really albinos, angsty albino people running around, but um, I, the feel definitely reminded me of Elric in terms of um, this sort of weird dreamlike world where this weird stuff is going on, and that kind of makes sense because it's a lot about mental illness. Yeah. So we talked about prose. So I, w- I, you know, sorcery or you know, subgenres, any anything you want. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So we talked about prose, and prose is one of those things where you know, and not that I don't like accessible prose, but 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 I do, like I said, love me some some elevated prose. I'd like to see more and more of that in fantasy. I understand why it's going the other direction. That that that, and perhaps you know, a lot of audiences want something a lot more accessible and easy to get into. Um, I would like to see, um, you know, certainly. Um, you know, people talk about romanticy and 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 why it's so popular now. That, but I do like, um, fa- uh, you know, there's a segment of, of fantasy authors and readers who don't enjoy uh, romantic relationships 
um, in the books that they, they read or write. So they don't write them and they don't enjoy reading them. I think when it's well done, it's certainly, re I, I enjoy reading it, frankly, in, in, in fantasy. And I enjoy, I think there was a trend in the past more to, you know, see more of that. I think relationships are, are critical. Romantic relationships and, and human relationships, that, that's that's a part of life. It's as much as, you know, if, you're, if you want your fantasy epic with great battle scenes, I think, you know, like romance will be also one of those things that you'd be looking for. Um, you know, so that's I'd like to see more of that in in epic type fantasy. Um, you know, I'd like to see uh, I like the some of the trends that are happening right now are, are, are fabulous. You know, some of them. You know, um, I, I do enjoy seeing more and more um, diverse characters, which is great. And you know, I think diverse, diverse, diverse gender. I, I love seeing more of that stories about about worlds set outside of. You know, like a, a, a mainly a European context. You know, Asian-inspired worlds. You know, African-inspired worlds. You know, worlds from all over the globe. I love the richness of that and where that's going. You know, I think about you know someone like you know Evan Winter and 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 his 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 burning series of Rage Dragons. Yeah, they and... actually have Rage of Dragons over there. I'm kind of nervous to read it though because I read Black Leopard, Red Wolf, and that book just blew me away. <laughs> I'm that Rage of Dragons is just, I'm, it's just not going to be the same. <laughs> I hope it is, but you know. No, no, I and I haven't read uh, Black Emperor Red Wolf. It's on my shelf somewhere, but but I have read um, the first two books of which I've actually interviewed him on page two as well. Wonderful guy, and um, the, his books are. I think you'd find them a bit more traditional in terms of you know, like uh, from what I understand, you know, Marlon James. It, it's much more of a he said a psychedelic, you know, yeah, kind know. of. It's, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, so, but I, I can't wait to read it. But just, yeah, very much more. I think you'd find. Don't. I wouldn't be nervous if you're. It's not like that. Certainly, it's. it's well, it's no, much I, more... I, I'm just hoping. Like, it's kind of the same reason why I've I've been hesitant to try Firefly because I like Cowboy Bebop so much, and I'm afraid like if I start watching it, I'm just gonna be like, this isn't as good. I'm gonna. I'm, I, I can't do this. I gotta turn this off. But, <laughs> Completely irrational, but it's like you know, it's a thing. Yeah, well, every book has their own, its own merits, right? We like yeah, different kind of books for different reasons. You, you you read something that's one way, that doesn't mean you, you can't like a book that's that's not another way, right? So, but yeah, those are just some of the trends that I, I I'm really enjoying seeing in 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 fantasy. So. Well, I mean, um, well, I mean, I, I don't want to hold you on for too much longer, but I do have one more thing I wanted to ask you about because you mentioned prose. And um, I, I thought it'd be interesting to talk about this. You know, I, I noticed because um, I you know I, I've I've written my novel, and I'll admit, uh, being a journalist, they really drill it into your head to keep it as kind of straightforward as possible, sort of Hemingway esque, if you will. Um, which you know is fine. That definitely has its its purpose, but. I've noticed there's this trend, at least in, in writing in general, that I've seen where they want it to be more cleaner. They want it to be as succinct as possible. And I don't really have a problem with that. I mean, well, okay, I kind of do. That's why I'm talking about it. But I think there are some... I, I don't think it's entirely a bad thing is what I'm trying to say. But at the same time, I think that this trend where they're trying to like drill it into people... I think sort of takes away the the musicality of, of more evocative prose. I, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on that because I've just I've noticed that and it's just kind of bugged me a little bit. <laughs> no, yeah, I see what you're saying, and I think there's a place for both. I think there's a place for stripped back, bare prose books in every genre, including fantasy, and I think there's a place for much more, um, you know, uh, books that uh, take their time exploring. There's a lot more exposition. There is, and the prose itself, because of it's evocative, also makes the book denser. And I said, I keep going back to people like Jenny Wirtz and Guy Gabriel Kay and, and Smith Spark that, you know, I am bedazzled by the fact that they put so much other, what some people would consider extraneous stuff in their books and just in the way they write, right? And, and uh, strip back prose, I think, works well for things like pace, especially in books like thrillers and mysteries and, you know, uh, but, uh, where it's it's all about the yeah, pace and how works, fast you're getting. It really works in like crime novels. I've noticed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I feel that in science fiction and fantasy, where you're building secondary worlds and you want to paint a picture, and where typically they're very character and and especially the epic like character. Dystopian. 
I could see it working in dystopian because I read a book called Tender is the Flesh, which has a very stripped back bear style, and it worked because that's because like how I view prose, it, prose, good prose, should be appropriate to the story that it's telling. No, I agree with you, and and I, but I feel that more elaborate prose again, um, if you're creating a rich, lush, vivid world. I don't feel there's anything wrong with having rich, lush, vivid prose and or a lot more exposition to, to bring out how I, you don't have to do it that way. You can still convey the depths of your world by not doing a lot of uh, expositions and or what some people consider info dumping, et cetera. But, but I, I also don't feel it, it, it's a bad thing. Like, I, don't um, think I think like Lord of the Rings would nearly hit as well, at least the books anyway, if it were more like stripped back, you know. Yeah, agreed. And and I, I, you know, I'll just tell you personally, I don't prefer generally, I don't generally, I'm not without exception, but I don't generally prefer the strip back style. I like the more uh, evocative stuff. And I, I like the the more ex stuff with more exposition. And, and that's how I write too. So, you know, I think it's just a taste thing. And it's also and if you're someone who's a mood reader, I'm not so much a mood reader, but there may be times when you know, I just want to read something quick, easy, you know, Strip back, yep, get it done, entertaining, and you know, what it doesn't mean that a book with that can't have deep themes or etc. It's just that you know, um, you may want to read something that that is not as as in you might feel as complicated or as you know, etc. Or but then you may, you know, you may be in a mood where you want to read something a bit deeper. So I think it just depends, right? You can enjoy both, and you know, um, there's nothing wrong with that, I think. But I, I definitely know where my preference lies, hence why I read the Malazans and the. The, you know the the sub wars of light and shadow and the, the the prince of nothing stuff and the you know I but I've enjoyed books that are much uh, less like that so yeah no it's it's just kind of I find it interesting because you know I mean you know there's people who are like maybe you could tighten this a little and then I, I just kind of think I'm like well maybe I don't want to do that but you know I, I have a bit I mean I, I know I don't have to listen to every single you know feedback i get but it's just something i've taken into account and I'm, I'm always curious to hear different views about that and well you mentioned you like prose so i thought it'd be something i'd like to ask you about your thoughts on that yeah well i appreciate that and i appreciate this interview it's, it's been awesome and yeah like you know and i and i think uh read read what you like when you want to read it and and if that's something that's you know very dense and with um you know, much more lyrical or evocative prose, read that. And if you like the more stripped back stuff, read that and just be whatever you do, enjoy what you read and 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 don't um don't read you know, read try new experiences and try different types of books and you know um don't restrict yourself is I, I feel but then if you feel you only want to read a certain thing then redo that. Just the main thing is be happy uh reading because it's most important that I feel that you read period rather than what you're what you're reading. I mean, amen. That's that's really. I mean, that's really what you look for when you read. Just you know, read what you like, right? <laughs> um, but Mr. Stewart, I, I hate to let you go, but I do have other things I hope to do, and I'm sure you have other things you need to do. Um, but thank you so much for being so giving with your time, though. I, I appreciate you coming on here. Um, as I as I or oh, oh, were you gonna say something? No, no, not at all. I just want to say thank you so much, and it was an honor to be here. Oh, um, I, well, I was going to say, before you, you go, um, if you have any social media you'd like to share, feel free. Oh, awesome. Thanks. Yeah, um, the website for the books, www.pilstart.com. Find out all things about the Dragon King Saga, etc. cetera. Uh, X slash Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, they're all at P.L. Stewart Writes. Um, and then um, Before I Go Blog, where I'm assistant editor, blog. You can see my reviews that I write there and on Goodreads. So those are the primary spaces where you can find me on social media. Very good. Well, um, again, Mr. Stewart, thank you so much for um, for coming on here. I, I appreciate I really enjoyed this conversation. I, I hope you did as well. Um, oh, definitely. Thank you so much. And I'm honored. Thanks again, Britton, for having me on. We should definitely uh, talk again at some point. Um, Absolutely. I'd be honored. That'd be, that'd be fabulous. But so. again, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate this. I've had a lot of fun. Me too. Thanks so much. All right. All well, the take best care. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Until next time.